And thank you, Margie, for that nice, uh, nice intro. Um, you all set? Uh, you know, I had, I had another painting prepared, and, and it was a, a, a morning misty thing, and then I, um, I didn't realize, I, I went back to your website, and I just wanted to make sure I hadn't done something similar, and I did. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this morning I got up, and I was terrified, I, I, so I, um, I, I, you know, I went down, and um, uh, I knew I wanted to do something from Maine, and I, um, and I, I found something sunny, so. Um, and I think we needed after the uh, last week that we had it with all that rain and stuff. I think it had a. Um, uh, but I do want to say one thing about a, a gray day. You know, a lot of us like to go out to the park when it's a beautiful like today. You know, run, we run out there and we try to um, set up and, and, and do our painting under under those conditions. But you know, um, I made a career out of fog and gray days. So don't overlook a gray day or a foggy day. And the nice thing about a, um, an overcast day, and maybe I said this last time is that um, uh, they do provide, um, as for a learning experience, you know, you can go out there, you, the frustrating thing about a day like today, when you paint, is you just get a couple hours before the light changes so much that you can't study it anymore. You better get, you better work fast, because your idea can change in a matter of time, you know. We try to get out at sunrise, there's this, um, time of day called the golden hour, and it happens twice a day. It's, it's basically when the sun is less than a 15 or 20 degree angle to the, your location, and the sun hangs really low, and uh, that's the best time to paint. You know, as the sun goes up in midday, shadows get smaller, less interesting, and the color gets washed out of the landscape. So anyway, but the nice thing about a gray day is that you can paint all day long, and not have to worry about the light changing because it's you know it's it's constant. But with all that said, I'm going to try to do something this afternoon with um, a, a little scene from Acadia National Park. It's Eagle Lake. Uh, it's one of my favorite spots uh, to paint. Um, uh, I understand that it, uh, because of COVID that um, uh, there are waiting times to get to top of Cadillac Mountain. You have to get a ticket. It is so overrun with tourists. And I went back. Um, when I first, first went there about 20, 30 years ago, it was a really quiet national park, and, it, and I understand it's not the case anymore, but um, there's this little spot called Eagle Lake. It's a nice trail. It has a lot of the um, carriage path, which the Rockefellers had built for uh, horses and carriages and horse, horseback riding, and today it's mostly used by um, uh, hikers and, and bicyclists that go through the park, but there's a, there's a little spot, very pleasant. Uh, a quiet spot, and um, a couple of the points I want to make today is one. One is um, I, I, I do want to get some distance in my work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the greens and how we can push uh, get some additional depth in our work. Before I do anything, we're going to start with the lightest thing in our picture, and that's um, generally speaking, it's uh, usually the sky. So, um, and I like to, um, if you've seen a demo of mine before, you know I work really wet and I uh, get the paper soaking wet top to bottom and in my scene the, um, the sky and the reflection of the sky are the two lightest elements in the picture. So I have the reflection of the sky on the water. Oh, I don't like this, I don't see you guys. <laughs> still here. You are? <laughs> You know what, yeah, you know, um, during COVID, I was doing a whole bunch of these Zoom things. Oh my God, I hated it. I, I couldn't yeah. interact with people, and, and that's all I've done. And, you know, I, I teach a lot, and um, I need the feedback. And it was just weird sitting in my studio alone doing a painting. What kind of paper do you um, This is uh, Arches, 300-pound uh, paper. It's very, uh, I use... Um, uh, I don't have to, I'm, I'm lazy and I don't like to stretch paper or have to cold press, cold press rough. Um, I, I prefer rough uh, for the landscapes, cold press for uh, perhaps uh, architecture, things that you don't need to have a lot of texture on the paper. Because there's a it's, a, it's a morning sky and there's going to be a little, um, I want a little bit of color in the sky, but not a, you know, not a, not a lot. I'm thinking a little cat orange. 
and uh, Cat Scarlet. You know, and whatever I do up in the sky, I do want to repeat again in the, um, oh, and by the way, this is going to look white, but I want there to be a little bit of color for my, uh, for my clouds. Uh, it's going to be, um, uh, let, me, let me change that. It's going to be more of a, a, a clear effect. So I want towards the horizon there to be a little uh, warm color. There's always a progression in your clear skies. It's, you know, on a, on a clear day, the apex of the sky is very, very dark. And then as you look towards the horizon, it gets progressively lighter. That's the very least. But sometimes there's a progression of color in the sky. At the apex, it's very, uh, not that we ever paint the apex, but it's more towards uh, a, a violet blue. And then as you look at the part of the sky that we most lo uh, look at, there's a progression going from ultramarine blue to cobalt blue, which is true blue you would see more often. And then towards the horizon, which sometimes it can uh, warm up. Some days we consider to be reddish days, some days we consider to be orange days. And there's even, uh, occasionally, there's a, on a cold, you picture a cold winter's day, and you'll see a progression of a blue, a true blue, to a bluish green. Uh, and light, oh, again, always lighter towards the horizon. So my morning is going to be um, more of an orangey morning. So I want to get more orange to, to red light along the horizon. Whoa, that was a mistake. But no worries, my paper's soaking wet, and I'm going to pour off, in a moment, I'm going to pour off a lot of this paint anyway, so it's not an issue. And as long as my paper's soaking wet, um, I can do whatever I want to it. I could, um, not that I will, I could spit at it if I wanted to, and it wouldn't make much of a difference, right? And this is some uh, uh, Windsor Blue Green Shade. It's more of a, a blue that has some uh, yellow in it to, to green in it. And there's also a progression in our skies towards the... Um, there's also a progression in our skies towards the sun and away from the sun. So um, closer to the sun you would have more of a less a true blue like cobalt more to a greenish blue like Windsor blue or um, uh, a color like it, like cerulean. Okay, I'm going to get a little darker, a little bluer along the top part of the sky. And there's my progression to a lighter color towards the horizon. And there could even be a progression left to right. The sun is off to the left. The sky in this quadrant could be more of a greenish blue to, to more of a cobalt blue uh, going away. So then we're just going to roll this paper around to blend. And I do want to pour off some of this. Do you want some paper towels? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I use Arches uh, uh, mainly by default. I would prefer another brand. I used to use um, a, a paper. Uh, much better. Now we can really roll this around. Some of the best painting we do is often without a brush, right? Like I'm doing right now is to pour, pour the paint around. Um, thank you. You're welcome. It's not exactly that. When you pour it down this way, you're going to notice some lines that are going in into the wash. If you want to get rid of it, you just pour it that way and it blend, you know, evens out. So there's my progression of value in my sky, going uh, from a darker, uh, a darker color along the, the top of the sky, and then lighter towards the horizon. 
Now I'm also going to do a, a kind of a repeat in the water. There's a reflection, there's a sky plane on the water. And um, usually when I get done with my sky and I have water in the picture, I immediately try to introduce color into the sky plane on the water. Your water has got to uh, relate to the sky. It's, it's, uh, it's reflective. It catches the colors in the sky. It, it, there's uh, other variables that can change its color, but you're going to have a, a relationship between the sky and the water. So in the water I want to introduce, I'm glad there's some pink that I put in earlier for the distant, uh, the distant water, but as I get towards the, uh, as we get closer to the viewer, up front, uh, you're gonna, we're gonna get more of the, the blue stuff going on um, from the top part of the sky. And I'm gonna, for that color, I'm gonna use a little bit more uh, cobalt, a little bit of the, um, the Windsor blue again, and we'll just pour it on and we're gonna roll it around. I always try to keep in mind things that are light reflect a little darker, things that are dark reflect a little lighter, and things around the middle valley reflect about the same. So my water, you know, should be as dark as the sky, or perhaps a little darker. And again, I'm going to roll it around uh, to blend. You know, years ago I did a I did a painting uh, um, again from um, Acadia National Park, and it had a. Um, it had a clear sky similar to just what I did now. And um, it was at the Salmagundi Club in New York. And uh, I, I only know the story because a student, one of my students, she was there. And uh, there was somebody giving a gallery talk, a gallery walk through the, and she was talking a little bit about each painting that was in the show. And when she got to mine, and my, my student, Gail, had overheard the, the uh, exchange between the woman um, in her group uh, talking about my picture. And when she saw my sky, she said, well, this artist obviously used an airbrush to paint their sky. You know what an airbrush is, right? Because it looks so smooth, you know? And uh, Gail was out there defending my, my <laughs> reputation, you know? And, and she said, no, 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 I take lessons with Joel, and he didn't do it that way. And it was this pouring technique and rolling the paint around it does produce a look uh, like you airbrushed it. I, you know, um, here, you know, here's another, ex uh, another example too of, um, uh, I paint in a studio, uh, uh, I paint with my friend John, who's uh, a, a good friend of mine, a, 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 an artist, and um, he's an oil painter. And he would often look at me do a sky like this, and he says, you know how hard that is to do in oils? <laughs> he says, you know, when you, when, you hit the, when you hit the lighter yellow stuff or the orange stuff in that part of the sky, and you try to blend it, with the blue stuff, it grays out and you get like smog. It looks like pollution in the air. But in watercolor, and it's always my point about the differences between, you know, the media. You know, uh, there are things in watercolor that are really super easy that are really difficult in oils, and vice versa. And I often get people um, that come to class, maybe you know, a real raw beginner, um, and they are, they they always ask. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm painting oils because I think it's easier, right? And, and you hear, you've probably heard that your, your response. It is not easier. It's just a different kind of a problem. And oil painting is not easy either. It's just a different sort of problem. But each media has its own um, um, easy things to do and difficult. And this is one of the easier things to do is to get a nice clear sky, which I, I would imagine is probably difficult to do in, in uh, acrylics as well just for the same reason. I'm going to pour off some of the excess paint. You know, we don't think of the, uh, we think of the paper sometimes as, as um, when we work in, in watercolor, as being, um, you know, really wet or really dry and, and, and um, yeah, and, and we don't, um, but there are different degrees of wetness to a sheet of watercolor paper. And this is the most wet that it can be. It is um, saturated. I know it's saturated because it can, and you all can see a shine on it. But in a few minutes, the shine is going to disappear, and we're going to have the second stage of wetness, which is, um, which is moist. And at moist, we can do some stuff to it. We can introduce, in fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a couple things in my sky. I'm going to introduce 
a couple a little low level clouds that are perhaps in shadow, not getting the full uh, uh, the sun in it yet. And I'm also going to put some texture into the surface of the water, a couple ripples. I apologize if I missed it, but did you, did you wet the back of the paper? No. You don't just, uh, no, you don't have to bother. You just use those clips and it doesn't Yeah, well, you really, don't forget I'm using 300 pound. Oh, in case you're wondering why my paper is not buckling, okay. if this was 140 or even lighter, my paper would have hills and valleys throughout, right? And the frustrating thing about that is that where there's a valley, it's going to dry darker. Where there's a hill, the top of the hill is going to dry lighter. You're actually going to see the wave. You can act. You can actually see the waves in it. Um, and what you'll have to do if you do work on 140 and trying to do a full sheet, you have to move the clips around a lot. But because this is 300 pound paper, it's not going anywhere. You know, I used to. Um, um, was, uh, this morning, my wife and I were just going through some um, some prints that I have of. I worked for an artist in New York when I graduated from uh, college. His name was uh, James McMullen, and he was um, a theater, uh, uh, water, an amazing watercolor artist. And um, we were we were looking through. Um, I forgot what I was going to bring this up for. What were we just we were just talking about? We're talking about the paper when. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, one of my responsibilities of working for this artist was I had to stretch his watercolor paper. Yeah. And he used to use 90 pound watercolor paper. And every Monday morning, it's hard to find. You know, uh, they, they still, it's still available. It's not any cheaper than the 140. But I would soak it in a tub of cold water and sheets of it. I had dozens of boards for him for the week, you know. And I would soak the paper and then the paper would expand. And while it was, while it was soaking wet, I would, you know, I would take these wooden boards and I would tape it to the back of the board with gum tape. And um, it, it was just so time consuming that when I, um, when I uh, was no longer working for him, I swear I would never do that again. <laughs> and that's when I started to work with the, um, I'm stalling for time, by the way, so thanks for your question, because I want the paper to dry a little bit. Oh, that's okay. why I asked. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you can start to see, and you know, how it dries or how it doesn't dry, how the humidity affects how it dries. And it tends to be wetter in the middle longer, and it tends to dry a lot quicker along the edge. And that saying dry, it's perhaps the wrong word. I'm, I'm looking for it to change from saturated to moist. Moist is when the shine just begins to disappear. And at that stage is when I want to come in here and hit a couple cloud forms that are kind of passing into the distance. And another thing too, you know, when we paint, when you do landscape work, you should make a decision. Is this a painting about, a, about the sky, or is this a painting about the landscape? Because you do one or the other. You either feature the sky or you feature the landscape, but you don't do both. Meaning you don't want to do a complicated sky and a complicated landscape, and vice versa. You want to do one or the other. So I'm going to do a fairly simple sky, but put the complexity, hopefully, into the um, you know, in, into the landscape. So right now I got, you know, and it's, it's still very, I'm going to pour off some of that excess stuff in the middle. I, I did this a moment ago. It doesn't matter. It's still, you know, it's still very, very wet. Jill, can you tell us about the brands of paint that you prefer? Yeah, I use, um, I use mostly the, um, the Windsor & Newton, you know, the professional list. I don't use the, um, don't use the student grade. As my grandma would say, you know, cheap is expensive. It doesn't, um, it doesn't, um, they put more media, uh, they put more um, medium in it than they do pigment, so you're actually using more paint. You know, now we're getting to the, and I, um, I also use Sennelier, I have a couple, you know, cobalt is one of those colors that's, that seems to be um, inconsistent, uh, you know, and, and, it, and it, uh, sometimes um, I like to use Sennelier, it's a French brand, and I, I would buy the, the cobalt blue or maybe, um, maybe their greenish, uh, greenish blue, like their, the phthalo, a phthalo blue. And I also like um, Old Holland, if you can find it. Old Holland makes a really, really nice uh, cobalt. The, the, their Old Holland, is, I, I understand, is the best paint that you could buy, and it's, not, and it's pretty true with watercolor. Um, but I like their cobalt blue. Uh, and Schmenke, I used to use that German brand, which is, which is pretty good. 
Okay, now my paper right in here is starting to get to be that second stage of wetness. I can see the shine is just beginning to disappear, but it's still very wet. And, and the nice thing about uh, uh, that stage of wetness is when I put a color into it, when I put some paint into it, the edges of the wash are going to um, soften, which is what I want. I want my clouds to have a soft edged appearance. Then my clouds are in shadow, so I'm going to use um, ultramarine blue, a little bit of, uh, of, of cadmium red medium, kind of graze it out, it makes it a little, uh, a little bit on the purplish, uh, purplish side. And of course, because my paper's wet, I don't want to add more water to the paper. I only want to add color. So that's why I'm going to dip my brush into Kleenex to remove the excess paint. So it's loaded with color, not a lot of water. Because if I introduce water to the paper right now, you're going to get a bloom, which I don't want. Right, I want a soft edge shape. So I've um, loaded up my uh, shadow color for the cloud. I've gotten rid of the excess. Um, water out of the brush and I'm gonna put a couple soft edge clouds and you can see that the the paint kinda stays put and I'm able to paint a nice cloud shape and the edges go soft but it's the paper's not so wet where the paint just bleeds all over the place and overtakes the whole sky right it just kinda stays put and, and also retains the value doesn't get it doesn't really get any uh, doesn't get really lighter, which would happen when you there was a lot of water on the page. It would not only spread all over the place, but it would also get a little lighter in value. I don't want to make the same cloud shape or the same weight, so I've got like a papa bear, mama bear, and little baby bear clouds, right? It's all, a little bit of French ultramarine with some um, uh, cadmium red medium. I'm painting over uh, in this area. I have some. I'm going to have some darker trees. They're considerably darker than this light color, so I can paint right over them and not worry. We often don't um, think about that, but it's important to consider. I, I, as a teacher, I get really frustrated when I see. Um, uh, a, a novice uh, uh, or even an intermediate painter kind of paint around stuff and they don't really have to. You can put paint on areas that you know are going to be that are eventually darker and you don't have to waste your energy trying to paint around a tree shape or a mountain shape. You can paint right over it provided that that underlying color is not going to um, um, be too dark. You know, I, I would normally like, I have, this is very level towards the horizon. Um, if I had more of a complicated sky, and I have a, you know, uh, some of the paintings that I brought in today, I, the cloud forms, I have more of an angle at, at the top part of the composition to draw the eye in. And then as I get to the horizon, I level out a little bit. You see, and then we begin to make like a Z shape in our cloud forms. So, um, uh, so cloud kind of go in that direction and then they level out and then they go back again that way more level and that's a nice way to get a little um, movement, eye movement from your viewer into your, into your painting. All right, I think I have enough, um, I think I have enough clouds in there. I could, you know, put a couple smaller ones really way into the distance. Sometimes these can get a little, a little lighter, a little bluer. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. Now I want to, um, to work a little bit on the texture on the surface of the water. Uh, in the foreground, and then again I could take a, this time more cobalt blue, gray it out, Payne's gray. I don't use Payne's gray. When I say Payne's gray, it's the color that I mix. I don't use store-bought Payne's gray. I prefer uh, to mix my own. That way I can control how much um, other colors that I put into it. You know, they used to make Payne's gray that used to, Payne's gray is really not even a color, it, it's an idea, it's a theory, you know, it, it, it's not a, a color, because Payne's gray, Payne's gray technically it's a blue gray, so it could be, sometimes it could be grayer than blue and vice versa, you know, um, and it was named after an artist, guess who? 
No, it was Greg. No. <laughs> yeah, it fell from my joke. Um, I, I did have a, I, I teach a children's class, and there was a, a, a girl, and her, name, her last name was Greg, and she thought the color was named after her family. It's just very really cute. Um, uh, it, it was invented by an English artist. It's the color, it's the con, uh, shadow control outdoors. There's a color called puce. Um, and puce, again, it's another color, it's a theory. Some people say puce is a green, some people say puce is a violet. Um, but puce is the shadow control, it's a color that you mix into the shadows for your indoor under the north light work. Outdoors, we have the same kind of a color. It's a color that we add to our mix, and that's Payne's gray. But I don't, you know, I don't know anybody that mixes with Payne's gray for the shadow. Um, I guess some people do. Payne did, right? Um, he, he mixed this color. But for that very reason, because you don't, sometimes you want a, 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 a Payne's gray that's more blue or more gray. And they used to make um, Payne's gray out of ultramarine blue and um, ivory black. And um, when ultramarine, ultramarine blue got more expensive, they switched, to, the paint manufacturers switched to another kind of blue, which is really cheap, like um, phthalo blue, which is a slightly, as, you, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's a slightly greenish blue. And um, so we went from a Payne's gray that was made out of a violet blue to a greenish blue. But I prefer, and I was always taught, to mix Payne's gray out of cobalt blue, true blue. Cobalt blue is neither yellow in it nor violet in it, it's true blue. And I have Payne's gray, I have black in my palette anyway, so I don't need to buy that. And I'm able to control with ivory black and cobalt blue how gray or how blue my, my, um, my Payne's gray is going to be. Anyway. In the foreground here, we have a little bit of a disturbance on the water. And while the paper's moist, I'm going to put a couple lines in here, but I'm not going to make them, uh, at least on the lower part of my, of my picture, I'm not going to make these little ripples. You know, you look at water, and you, you might be sitting in a harbor or by a lake, and you look at the water, and even though the water is a relative dead calm, when the water tilts this way, it gets slightly darker, and when it goes flat again, it's catching more of the sky, it gets lighter. So I want to put a couple ripples in here, in, in the water. And in, in the foreground, um, because of my perspective, the way I'm sitting there, these lines in the foreground could be on a, on a little bit of a curve. And the texture of the water as we go back begins to level off. And I'm not going to make my lines on, a, on an angle anymore. I'm going to make them more um, straight towards the horizon. I didn't do a very good job of that. but. Um, I have a little bit of a curve. And the other thing that happens, when the viewer picks up one of these lines, their eyes go this way, and then they might follow a light pattern to that way. There's my Z. Or I can organize the light patterns in a way that leads you out. I'm always amazed when you put a couple of these lines into the, into the surface of the water, how the water really does flatten out and feel like it goes back. A moment ago, it just appeared like it was going up and down. Now, because of the introduction of a few lines for some texture, the water seems to level off and look flat. Of course, this will dry a lot lighter. I don't want to overdo the texture. It's not, you know, I, I, I do want to make it, um, um, you know, not terribly agitated, but just a little bit of a, um, an, a agitation on, on the water and a little texture in the water. Who knows, at, at, you know, and, and at the end of the painting, I might want to texture this more, or if the wind kicks up, you might see more of a heavy chop, and then I'd have to go in here. But for starters, this is a good, good place to be. Now, um, since I no longer have a need for a hairdryer anymore, I use them for my paintings. Let me hit the hairdryer, because I want it to be completely dry.
you know, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it, it sure is bothering the hell out of me, but um, there's a little streak in here. And, and you know, you, I guess, yeah, you know, yeah, you can actually see a scratch in there. I can't see it, but I know that would drive me crazy. Yeah, and, and you know why it's there, because I changed my mind about the demo, right? And so I, I had a sketch, <laughs> I had just the indication of where the top mountains might be. And when I erase the line, you can actually see it, it still shows up. You know, mem I, as I always like to say, you know, paper has a memory. You know, it remembers what you did, right? And, you know, it got, I, I remember a couple times when I've done a really nice sky in a picture, and I could just see the pencil line from a, a, a mistake that I made earlier in my drawing, you know? And it, like you, I, I'd get so angry at it, I'd have to take a new sheet out and just start over again. And you know what I do now? Sometimes I kind of figure out where my horizon is going to end. And then I do my sky first without any pencil lines on the work. And then, because, and the other thing too, once you put a wash down on a pencil line, it shellacks it there, for lack of a better term, forever. The line, no matter how hard you try to erase that line, it just doesn't seem to go away. So um, sometimes I do my sky just anticipating where the horizon ends and the landscape would begin and then I do my drawing after the sky's been finished and I get a blemish free sky. So that's a hot tip for you, you know, if you don't do that already. What are you doing now? What would you, what would you do now? I'd probably start over, you know, She's seriously. Sir, I mean, unless, <laughs> maybe put a nice tree back, I don't know, right, I, mean, okay. can't, I can't put a tree back there because it's not, right. that's where it's going to go. Or, or just, um, you know, just charge extra, you know. So, <laughs> Um, I studied. Uh, I studied with a couple of great. I studied with a lot of great artists in my life, and um, one one was um, Arthur Maynard, who uh, taught at the Art Institute where I where I teach at now, and um, he studied. He studied from a man named Frank Vincent Dumont. Dumont was um, a teacher at the Art Students League for many many years. He was probably more remembered for his uh, skills as a teacher than he was a painter. I think he had one show in his entire life. And his paintings were magnificent. And the critic at the time who reviewed his show had said that, you know, when they talk of Velasquez, they'll talk of Velasquez's use of black. And when they think of Damone, they'll think of his use of green. Damone went to, um, he studied at the Academy Julian in Paris. And the Academy Julian can trace their art lineage, which I am very proud to be a part of, right? Um, back to the um, uh, Fontainebleau, the, the uh, Barbizon School of painters. And their uh, Barbizon School was a group of landscape painters that painted in uh, Fontainebleau, uh, the park there. And um, Damone, being in Europe, had begun to see some of the painter, paintings being done. And even in that short period of time, maybe a hundred years or so, some of the paintings had already because of the pigments that they were using, like oxide of chromium. Oxide is a very bad word in painting. Oxide means it turns, it oxidizes, it rusts, it turns a color over time. And if you ever look at a Corot painting, and Corot um, was one of the first um, artists to, to do kind of plein air painting, his paintings, some of his trees look black. And here we are, maybe a, a, a couple hundred years removed from when he painted, and Damone was aware of this. And he knew that a lot of the greens that you buy fade over time, you know, not fade, but oxidize over time. Oxide of chromium is, is, is a, and some of the yellows, chrome, uh, you know, chrome yellow, um, they deteriorate and they turn color. So he wanted to come up with a palette that didn't, um, uh, that had made use of permanent colors. So he had this whole string of greens that he had sort of come up, cad he would use the cadmium colors, which are heavy metal, and as far as we know, cadmiums will last hundreds of years before, you know, they will not fade over time, you know. And um, so he had come up, and he was using, he was experimenting with phthalo green, which is a new pigment at the time, it's a dye color. And he would use that with his greens, and he'd come up with a string of greens. And when I worked in oils, um, I mixed confidently, knowing that those colors were gonna be permanent. But when I went back to watercolor, I wanted, because he would do a whole string of um, greens with them from your, 
your lightest greens to your shadow greens. And I wanted to do the same in, a, um, in watercolor. And, and what I've done is I use, um, I, I now mix pre-mix four greens. Um, one is the green that we call parent green, which is just cadmium lemon with some phthalo green. And then we add more blue to it. And what happens is I've got a string of greens that gets progressively bluer in color temperature towards the shadow and darker. And then we add French ultramarine to the... You're dripping on the Oh, I am? Yeah. You know, if that ever happens to you... Ser seriously, that was planned. Teach us what you do. You just drop more water on it. And then, and then dab. All right, but don't... Um, but don't immediately... Uh, don't immediately hit it um, with a paper towel because you get a stain in there. Um, that should dry, and I'm not so concerned about it anyway because that's where a tree is going to be later. <laughs> and do you ever paint on the back? Of all the time, yeah. So this side's not. Even the the side that has the the side that has arches or the name brand, the watermark, that you could read it clearly, and you could read it in the corner here. It says Arches France, and it obviously if you flip the paper over, it's the back side. The side that has the watermark on it has a slightly better finish. That's the side you should try first. But when you screw it up, flip it over, work on the other side to save yourself 10 bucks, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, so what I'm going to do in my picture, um, I'm going to start off with my, I have a, a nearby island or nearby landmass here. And um, I don't know if you, could, you can see it in my, my, my reference. Um, that's what the scene is going to be. God, I've got to get moving here, right? Because you guys gonna want to break soon, right? Uh, the trees in this area have more yellow in them. And then as you look into the distance, you know that this mountain back here is filled with just as colorful and yellowish looking trees as the foreground, but it doesn't look that way. It looks progressively lighter and it is losing its, um, uh, it, it, it has more blue in it than yellow in it. Uh, and, and, and this is called atmospheric perspective. You know, we think of the air between us, well, well not these days, that's pre-COVID um, uh, or post-COVID, right? Um, we think of the air between us as, as nothing, right? But there, there's more than that. There's moisture in there. There's dust in the air. And, and when we're outside and it's a particularly damp day, there's a lot of moisture in the air. And what happens is that it, it obscures our ability to see the yellow part of the color spectrum. So when we look into the distance, we're no longer, and when you extract yellow from green, what do you get? You know, blue, right? Or a more bluish color, which is what is happening in here. And I'm going to try to do that today um, as I go across the landscape. My foreground trees are going to have lots of yellow, lots of richness, a lot darker in value. And then as I get back into the distance, it gets a little less yellowy and a little bluer. And then eventually, way into the distance, my mountains are going to get a lot lighter and a lot bluer in color. And hopefully, if we, if we do it correctly, we'll get this feeling that our picture really, really goes back. Okay. So I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to work, uh, I'll probably work on this cl uh, cluster of trees, and then finally, I'm going to work on that distant mountain, uh, you know, way into the back. For my greens, I use mainly uh, cat, cat, uh, cadmium lemon yellow with um, some ultramarine, mostly yellow. And I try to get my green around the value of a cadmium yellow deep. There's no cadmium yellow deep in the color. I try to get it to the darkness of the color cadmium yellow deep. And um, I'm going to put a tiny bit of red into it just to gray the color out slightly. Because it, after all, it's probably a half a mile away. And I want a little distance in there. You know, sometimes we hold the brush straight up and down to fill in an area. And then sometimes we, to get texture into the, uh, into the painting, we hold the brush almost parallel and we let this part of the brush touch the paper only. And we try to hit the top fibers. And it produces that nice dry brush uh, technique. And here I'm getting all the texture of the trees on the top part without much of an effort. If you've never done this before, and the first few times that you try this, it's really super uncomfortable, or what might happen 
is you get the ever-expanding tree, you know, you just, in an effort to try to get a nice shape to the edge of it. But it really is a nice way to paint. A little more unpredictable, which is what I like about it, because it looks more natural when it's, when we're not sitting here, you know, and being a, a filler inner. All right, don't ever be a filler inner. All right, so this whole, uh, I'm massing in this as an average, the whole group of trees. I'll go back into this later. I don't like to do the shadows now. I like to do that in a second step when it's dry. I look at density. Is there a lot of holes in here? No, there's not. This is filled in, um, this area of trees is filled in pretty uh, solidly. We don't see a lot of air holes that we can see in the distance. But I do want to have um, texture along the top edge of the trees. That's why when I fill in this part where I want it to be filled in densely, I'm holding the brush more upright. And then as I get towards the tops of these trees, now I'm taking the brush again and I'm scraping, I'm holding the brush parallel to the page. I'm trying to get the tooth of the paper into my um, strokes so that I get what looks like, and I think it does, a nice tree edge, or a tree shape. Right? Yes. Yeah, I need the positive reinforcement. I'm really insecure, if you can believe that. Um, all right, so I got that, 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 that uh, distant landmass kind of filled in. I'll hit shadows later on for the texture, for the trees and stuff. Let's go to this foreground stuff. Now, these trees in the foreground are mainly in shadow. And I, um, you know, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna try to block in the, um, you know, the evergreen trees um, a little darker in value. And I have a green that I've mixed up using more ultramarine blue than yellow. And I'm putting a tiny bit of red into it to, to uh, warm it up, gray it out a little bit. I'm going to use a script liner brush. It's one of those brushes that um, has really super long hair and a mind of its own. I'm sorry? Do you need clean water? No. Um, you know, a, a couple qualities that we want to get into our, you know, without getting into the whole tree thing. You know, you, you, um, uh, you look at a tree and you, and you look for a couple things. First of all, how, how dense is it? is it? Is there a lot of foliage? Is it filled in? Or, um, and you also look at its shape. Does it have a, a in evergreens or uh, evergreen trees it can fall into like three distinct shapes. Um, it can be cone shaped, uh, upside down ice cream cone shaped with a you know, curve along the bottom. Some hemlocks have a, you know, a, they droop towards the bottom so you can see a, 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 what appears to be like a, a, a more of a rounded base. And then of course it goes into a cone going up. And some trees, some spruces, their branches are, um, they don't droop. So you, like a Christmas tree, a balsam or spruce, it's just straight across the bottom, almost like as if somebody took a saw and just clipped off the bottom straight, and so it's more, more of a cone shape. You notice I'm saying not pyramid, I'm saying cone, I'm using a three-dimensional form, because I do want you to think in terms of the tree, not only, you know, uh, that goes around and back, right? So we have upside down ice cream cone, upside down cone, and then column shape. Um, cedars grow like that, very tall, narrow. Sometimes they're a little short and stocky, a little wider, but they're still considered to be column shaped, like a, like a Greek column on a temple, right? Just, you know, straight and tall. Uh, uh, cedars grow that way. They're a very common tree in our area. And then the, and then the fourth in, um, shape that you could possibly see some evergreens is spreading. It has no definitive shape. It kind of spreads out in all directions. And I'll do that, and I'll remind you of that as I go across here and I start to do this, this pine in here. So you want, um, you, you want it to fall into one of those four shapes. You look at the, the density. Is there a lot of holes through the tree? Um, is it filled in pretty solidly? Like a, like a cedar tree is very, very solid. You don't see any sky holes at all. And um, how do its branches grow? Sometimes at the top of the tree, the branches grow more diagonally. And as the trees get older and weightier, they grow out more horizontal. 
And sometimes they're so weighted they, they droop down and you get that, that, that curved bottom. So if you can look for that stuff, you don't have to be an arborist or know any, the first thing about trees. But if you can identify that stuff, you can um, sure, sure as heck paint them pretty well. Um, I'm going to start with the trunk of the tree. I know the trunk of the tree is a little uh, browner than that. It might have some... Uh, uh, I can glaze at some point, maybe later on, I can glaze um, a little red on top of this color, a little brown out, it'll be fine. But I like to start with at least, um, you know, uh, the main trunk of the tree. And it, because this tree um, is not very solidly filled in, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you're going to be able to see a lot of its uh, 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 trunk as well. Now, up at the top part of the tree, some of that early morning light is hitting the top boughs. So I'm going to use a green that has a little bit more yellow in it, a little lighter in value, a little bit more water into it. A moment ago I was holding the brush and it was only, we were touching the paper to, to, to describe the texture of those trees by scraping it on the side. Now I'm going to use the corner of my flat right here to, and I'm going to kind of paint and I'm going to lift up at the end because I want these branches to appear um, slightly pointed. Okay, so I got a color that's got a little bit more uh, yellow in it, so it's, it, it looks like sunlight. I'm holding the brush, you know, way at the end, um, and I'm lifting up to get more of a pointed look to, to my, my branches. That's a flat brush? I mainly use flats, yes. Um, I used to, um, when I worked for Jim McMullen, I used to use, um, like he did, uh, he used to use uh, these very expensive um, uh, round brushes, you know, Kalinsky, Kalinsky rounds and stuff. And I remember, um, you know, after I, I, I stopped working for him and I was studying with um, Maynard and, and, and John Osborne in oils, we, we were using flats for our landscape work, you know, a lot of flats. And, and, and when I went back to, um, when I went back to watercolor, because I wanted to do the same thing that I was doing in oils, in watercolor, um, I went out with my round brushes and I had a hard time painting trees. You know, the rounds are really good for certain things, but they weren't really, I found in my experience, they really weren't great for, uh, for, for the tree work. Um, you know, if you've heard, maybe if you heard the story, the story before, I apologize, but it's a good one. I, I wasn't feeling well one, one afternoon and um, I was kind of tired and it just was not feeling great and I needed a nap. And so I was at home and I, um, I, I put the TV on just to, you know, sometimes the TV kind of helps me fall asleep depending on what I'm watching, you know. And I'm flicking the channels and, and lo and behold, I come across Bob Ross. And, and you know, he's great for, um, he's like warm milk if, you, if, you're, if you're sleepy, you know. So I put him on thinking that I'm, you know, he'll put me to sleep in a, in a, in a minute, you know. So I'm, I'm kind of half in and half out of it and he, um, He's doing a, a tree, and he takes out an old house painting brush, right? And he kind of socks in this tree, and I go, whoa, that's not bad, you know? And it kind of occurred to me at that point, I used to use those, because essentially a house painting brush is a flat brush, right? I used to use those brushes in oil. Why am I restricting myself to round brushes in watercolor when I'm doing landscape? And <laughs> that afternoon, I went to the art store and I picked up a whole bunch of these flats, and I've, and I've never looked back. You know, and I and I and I use them primarily, you know, primarily for my um, for my landscape stuff. Uh, look how I'm holding the brush. I'm way at the end. I I prefer to paint this way. I'm not trying to be a filler inner, right? Getting in there. I'm holding the brush way at the end. Yes, I have my hand in my pocket. Um, it helps me to balance myself, right? But I'm holding the brush way here, so I'm painting using my whole arm instead of painting in a small, tight, tight way. You know, um, I like sometimes to do a combination of a, of a drag um, and then back to, um, you know, back to more of the corner of the brush again. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, take note. This is a spreading shape. My branches are um, uh, at the top of the tree growing off more diagonal. And at the bottom, 
they're leveling off. They're growing out more horizontally. And then um, way at the bottom here, they're, they're drooping. These probably could be um, more in shadow, so I can probably put a little bit more blue into, into my mix. You know, w when you hold your brush in this way, it is at first, the first few times you try it, and you know, even it, uh, it, it kind of uncomfortable, and it seems um, you know counterintuitive that to the way you should be painting. But um, after a while. You know, for me at least, it, it, it really is a nice way to, um, uh, to get an unpredictable shape and, and, and more, more, more natural looking shape in our trees. Okay. The next cluster of trees, this, this one seems to be um, uh, darker in value because it's in shadow, completely in shadow, so I'm going to put more, way more ultramarine blue into my, gr my green mix. And again, I'm, hold, you know, I'm holding the brush in a um, you know, way at the end. Um, I could scrape. Sometimes that gives you a nice, uh, a nice unpredictable shape as well. You know, there was a time, I'm almost embarrassed to admit, that I, I was such a control freak. I wanted these trees to look exactly like they look what I was painting from. Right? But um, I don't do that anymore. You know, we, I, I, I kind of know what their characteristics are now. And I'm trying to paint, not necessarily, um, I'm trying to paint the ideal and not necessarily um, that particular specific tree. There's a great book, um, it's meant for oil painters, but he talks about painting principle. Um, it's John Carlson's Landscape Guide to uh, uh, Landscape Painting for the Oil Painter, but it's it, it's a book that's filled with great wisdom about and good observations about um, <coughs> landscape painting in general. And he has a whole chapter on painting from memory, you know, without you know working from photo reference at all. And how you know how um, he apparently he used to take his students. Um, he, he he was a, a, a Massachusetts artist. I don't know where he, exactly where he taught, but he would take his students to a location and have them walk around. Um, no paints, just, just themselves. They would all take a walk in the woods. And the students, you know, uh, kind of went along with him on this walk. And then when they got back to the studio, he made them all do a painting of what they saw. Um, and I could imagine how terrified they were, right? You know, how can I do it? But, but he had them paint. And, you know, he, he, and it's true. When you paint from memory, you paint the ideal. You know, you don't paint... Uh, you know the specific specifics. Um, you paint paint the idealized tree, and then become a composer, not a copier, which is important. Right, now, now we're headed down to a part of the um, uh, of the trees down in here where. Um, it, it fill, it's filled in uh, fairly dense. They're all in shadow. So again, I'm going to use um, you know a color that has way more blue than yellow in it. How am I doing on time? Uh, you got about 45 minutes. Oh, okay, good. Because I could go on forever. But I'm sure you don't want me to do that. So. No, you don't. <laughs> and now here I got another pine out in here. I'm holding the, the corner of the brush. Um, I'm letting that only touch the paper. I'm lifting up at the end to get more painted uh, texture to my tree. And I'm fortunate I'm getting the ever-growing tree, which I was supposed to happen. That's better. 
And this is all in shadow, so I'm going to fill that in um, you know, uh, f fairly solidly. I don't see a lot of sky holes in this area. You know, I'm working on a full, full sheet. Um, you know, when I, when, I go, when I go outside and I paint, um, I use a half sheet to even a quarter sheet sometimes. Sometimes I take out a full sheet. And I know a lot of people are kind of scared to death to work on, I don't know what it is, maybe they're afraid to um, blow 10 bucks on a sheet of paper. Um, <laughs> is that what it is? These days? <laughs> wow, crazy. But they're afraid to blow 20 bucks on a sheet of paper, right? So it's a little intimidating to work large. But you know what? Um, when you work large, or when you do a large painting, like what, what's the first thing that you do when you go to a gallery or a museum and you see a large work? You take 10 steps back. What's the first thing you do when you see a small painting in it? You go right up to it, right? And your nose, you stick your nose in it, looking at all the things. The, the little paintings require a whole lot of detail and a whole lot more time and work in it, believe it or not. And the larger you work, it's actually easier because you're looking at the work from a distance and you can, you can do a little less work. You can put a little less detail in it because the viewer takes it in at a, at a distance away. So um, don't let that, um, you know, don't let the price of the paper, you know, mess you up. But now that you're looking at everything digital. Yeah, I know. Back to I know. It's true. Spots. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of truth. You know, and I, uh, you know, I, I jury a lot of shows, and I hate to do them by, uh, I hate to do them by, by internet or by, by uh, uh, digital. Because sometimes stuff looks very good yeah. digital, and some really good work looks really bad. And it ha I don't know whether um, I don't know what it is with um, you know, I don't think it's photography or whatever. But boy, when you take a painting in person, there's 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 a difference. I, you know, a, a good example that um, a few years ago there was a show at the Brooklyn Museum of uh, Sargent paintings. Right, there was that uh, show, a Sargent, and it what. Took a bus trip to the yeah, wasn't that a great show? Well, you know, you know what? It, you know what? There was one painting though that I had seen in books by Sargent. It was uh, Bedouins, and um, I always saw that picture. You know, the Bedouins had that, that where they, they 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 have that indigo yeah. in their and their and their skin tone actually, and the clothing that they wear is actually stained their skin a little blue and stuff. And there was a painting that I saw in books plenty of times. Bedouin, you probably know the painting. Um, you know, a, a couple of Bedouins in their in their um, garb, and I never thought much of the painting in, in a book, or even when I saw it online. Do you know I, when I saw that show, that was the one painting that haunt, haunted me. It was so cool, and it it was so a completely different experience than what I saw in a book or online. It was uh, I, and it was the one painting, and it wasn't that big. It was a little tiny thing, you know. But it, to this day, I think of that picture a lot. And, that, and another, there was another one of the uh, Homer painting with um, uh, two guys in the Caribbean. They're, they're turtle hunting, right? And among the, you know, the, the unique thing about the painting is that Homer did a little play with his signature on the painting. He has part of his signature half in water and half out of water. This is a little, you know, he was fooling around a little bit with the, you know, with, uh, with the painting. The, the, the signature is kind of... Um, a, a little weirded out from the water, right? But I saw that book, painting in books, never thought much of it, and I saw it in person, and it's such sparkle. And even as color co coats paintings, which I thought were really, you know, dismal and really, you know, um, awful. And I saw them up in Portland, in Maine, and um, oh my God, they were colorful, they were fresh, completely different than what I saw in the books. Anyway. I don't know what I was talking about, but. If you were a judge uh, doing a, a digital show, if we listed the size of the painting, would that make the job of? I, I don't, person? you know, um, maybe, but you know, who's really gonna, kind of, that's kind of hard to judge too, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if it, I don't know if it would. I don't know if it would really make that much of a. Um, what was the question? If you're judging a digital show, oh, digital, if you're judging a digital show, 
if they did, uh, at least my experience recently, we don't list the size of the paint. And some people say, well, I have a big painting. Yeah. It's all squashed up into the same size, thing, which is actually built up. And you notice when they print it in the book, the smaller paintings print better in the book than the big paintings because they get squashed. Now I'm getting to, down to, you know, uh, the reason why I don't like to do my shadows is precisely why I don't like to do my shadows first. I just like to do them in two, two layers because it does darken them up a little bit. As hard as I try to get that color dark, I don't think the value is dark. It's dark, but it's not as dark as I would have preferred it. Uh, close, but, uh, you know, not, not that, uh, you know, I, I, that's why I prefer to do it in two, you know, two washes instead of one. Um, I got a little bit of land here that's getting hit with some sunlight, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna uh, warm it up with a little bit more yellow, make it a little lighter, hopefully, than the rest of that. Again, here's some just miscellaneous uh, texture or foliage that I'm just gonna try to block in as a um, uh, a simple mass. I got some rocks on the bottom there that are uh, that are warmer in color temperature. I'm going to add a little bit of a cat scarlet, and a little bit of cat orange, to get those uh, those warmer tones for the rocks. And then I have the reflection in the water. And for the reflection, I like to use um, again a flat brush. And I'm I'm, I'm painting the same. I'm using the same uh, greens that I was using a moment ago. Right, as I said earlier, things that are um, things that are light should reflect a little darker. Things that are very dark should reflect a little lighter, and things around the middle value should reflect about the same. So this is about the middle value. So it's going to so whatever colors I was using up here, I'm going to use in the in the water again. Take the flat brush. I want it to look like there's a little bit of disturbance. I just try to line up my shapes seems fairly solid in here. I could leave a little gap. Maybe there's a little disturbance in there where you're catching some of the light. Am, is everything alright? I can't see. Um, take your flat brush and if you want to paint a nice uh, calm reflection, hold the flat. You know, how many different ways did I make a point about holding the brush today, right? Mm -hmm. so sometimes you want to hold the brush on the side and scrape it. Sometimes you want to use the corner of a flat. Um, uh, in this case, when I would do a reflection, I'm going to hold the brush more this way and make uh, you know, lots of uh, horizontal strokes, at least for the end of the brush. And I'm lifting up to, to describe that disturbance on the water. I also want to keep it in line. Right? Remember earlier, I put a, a little angle on, um, on, on the uh, texture of the, of the water. So I want to um, kind of be consistent. Joel, it looks like on your palette. I, yes. Did you mush up all of your greens? I just, I did four. Yeah, but you're not using them separately. You put them all in? No, I got them separate. All right. Yep. When you pick up the color book? OK. I don't want to drip on my painting like I did no, last time. But I, I, can you see the, you can look at it later. They're, they're just four separate. I have a, I have a parent green, which is hardly, we hardly use it for anything other than we might add it uh, to make a lighter value in the, in, the, in, the gra in the grass. Then we have the sunlight, upright sunlight value of trees in the sunlight, which is, has a little bit more blue than yellow, uh, has mostly yellow, but we, we introduce some ultramarine into it. And then we have a green called orange value green. It's not, there's no orange in the color. Can you see it? Okay, so this is parent green, has just cat, cat lemon and a little touch of phthalo green. And then there's a second green, which has a little bit more ultramarine blue in it, mostly yellow. And then we have this color, which is called orange value green. It's the value of orange. It's a good color to use for evergreen trees or greens on an overcast day. And then finally, we have a green that we've mixed with mostly ultramarine blues, very dark. It's around the value of cadmium red, red medium. And we use that for our shadow greens. Again, I'm going back to some sort of reflections in here. Um, I'm taking the flat brush, making a side-to-side -side motion. 
I think at a distance it looks very good and it looks um, very much like um, a, a, you know, a water reflection. And then of course I got the tree in there so I'm going to take my, um, my, my script liner brush with a little touch of red at, uh, along with the green to, to, to brown up the color a little bit. Line up my lines so they match. And then do the same thing, a little squiggle. For the, you know, the 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 tree branches. Does that look like good enough? Right. Yes. Okay. So now in the distance we have our mountain, and um, we're using greens in the foreground that has a lot more yellow than blue in them, right? And I will now want to put some. I want to put a couple miles of distance between these uh, closer greens that are to us, and I'm going to do that. You got a couple options. You can gray. You can take this green, the sunlight green, and you, can, you could gray it out. You could add red to it, which will gray the color out. You could add ivory black to it, which will also gray it out. I think the red makes it look like a dry day or a dry spell. The, your greens in the distance tend to look a little like, like we're going through a drought. Or um, same thing with the black. It really does uh, gray the color out in a way that it looks like burnt foliage or dried up foliage. But I want it to look like a wet morning. So in order to subtract the yellow, I'm just going to have more blue, because that'll do basically the same thing. So my, my greens back in here are going to mostly, uh, they're going to be lighter in value, and they're going to be bluer in color, bluer in color temperature. I'm going to use mostly um, cobalt blue. And I'm going to have a couple of piles of uh, paint uh, kind of ready to go. Can you see this stuff here or no? No? Huh? Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of um, paint. I'm mixing a paint gray, cobalt blue, and ivory black. And then I'm going to add a little touch of the of the um, green and the, the yellow gr green color in there. And I got a lot of water in this color. Quick test. Uh, um, could have a little bit more yellow in it. I got a lot of water in it because I want to lighten the value. see the difference in value right now and you can see that it has a little bit of um, yellow in it for the green part right I'm gonna work I'm gonna try to work quick because I want to do a, a couple things before this color dries I don't want it to, to dry here's where it meets the the uh, lake You know, I want to get a nice shape to my, my trees, I mean, my mountain. Since this is a little closer to us, I can have a little bit more yellow in the mix, but it's certainly not going to be um, as yellow as that. You know, and when you're, when you're faced with a, um, when, you're, when you're working with a lighter color and you've and you got a darker color next to it, you can very easily without doing much harm or you know without wrecking the color in here you can take this lighter color and just gently wipe over it so that our mountain looks like it disappears behind the mountains but don't draw back you see I, I was able to wipe on top of that without getting some of the green into the into my distant mountain now this mountain back here has a shadow on it and for that, I'm going to use a color. I'm going to do a wet and wet. I think my paper's wet in that area. And there's also some shadows on the mountains back in here. And I'm going to take mostly the cobalt blue, and gray it out with a little bit of ivory black. And because my paper's wet, I don't want to add more water to the mix. I only want to add color. So I'm going to wipe it into the paper towel before I hit the paper. This part of the mountain way into the distance here is in shadow. So I'm just dropping this uh, bluish gray into that part. 
it's distant. I don't want there to be a hard edge because another property about stuff that goes into the distance, not only does it get lighter in value, but it also um, it gets blurred out a little bit, right? I always think of that um, uh, Las Meninas by Velazquez, that painting it in the Prado. The um, it's the it's the Royal Spanish Court, and all the ladies in waiting and all the people at the court are in the foreground. And in a mirror, you can see the king and queen, really tiny. I don't know how he got away with that. Right? But you put the king and queen waiting in a mirror in the distance, but they're blurry. And it was like the first time, you know, in, in, in the history of art, like everything up to that point, everything was in sharp focus, right? Every element of the painting was in sharp, sharp focus. But he actually blurred something out intentionally to give the illusion of space. You know, as I, as I look at one of you, the rest of you all blur out. And then as I move my eyes to the rest of you, know, to another person, that person's in focus and the rest of you blur out, right? That's just the way we see. Um, uh, he was like one of the first artists to, to notice that. So things in a distance get, get, get soft edged. That's why I think it's important to do our clouds. So, um, uh, so, so soft edged. There's a, um, this part of the mountain's a little closer to us than that part, right? It goes back and up. So this part of the mountain might have a little bit more of, of, of color richness to it, more yellow in it, so I can, so I can work some colors in it. And that, too, will make the mountain feel like it's going back. Wherever there's a, um, a shadow in the mountain, I can do that while the paper is wet. Uh, And I get that soft edge, except for there. <laughs> there might be a little ridge in the, in the mountains or some texture in here. It's a little darker. You know, we, the stuff that's close to us, we have to describe a little bit more with more stuff in it, but the stuff in the distance can just be um, kind of blocked in um, in, a, in a general way. And then we have... Um, Mountain back here's why I'd be careful because some of this is still wet. This is that same blue color I was using a moment ago. And does it feel like there's miles of distance? Now there's a there's a couple rocks, um, you know, in, in the in the, fore, in the foreground. I can uh, kind of block them in. The rocks on the tops are uh, rounded, more rounded in shape, and where it meets the water, uh, it, it, you know, it's not reflective. So the bases of these rocks are going to be uh, level. The tops can be uh, nicely rounded. I always like to make a point about when painting rocks. Rocks that sit in the water have a kind of erosion on them that um, you know makes them more rounded in, in, in form. Rocks that sit out of the water, uh, maybe up a, on a rocky ledge, have a different kind of erosion at work. It's ice, and um, uh, and so therefore you might notice rocks are more angular out of the water, but they're also, um, they're also influenced by, um, you know, ra rain and, and uh, that kind of erosion as well, wind. So I want my rock forms on the top to be um, rounded, more uh, level as they uh, as they sit as they sit in the water. Now I'm going to go back into here and I can um, put some shadows on that mountain. You know, for the most part, um, other than maybe a couple shadows that I, I could hit on that mountain back in here, that, that distant mountain is basically done. Right, we don't have to do a lot of work back there, but we do have to do more work in the foreground, more detail, and um, more texture in the front. Um, so. 
you'll you'll see in here the the bottom of the um, of of this uh, landmass has some dirt, rocks, whatever. I'm going to put a, a light wash of uh, some pallet scraps with some red in there. Um, look like a bank on the, on the water, and then there's a couple little um, shadows through the trees and stuff. The light source comes in from the left, so there's going to be hard edges on the right side of our shadow shapes, and a half tone or a soft edge on the left sides of these shadow forms. So I'm going to grab our um, shadow green. The shadow green has way more blue than yellow in it. You can put a tiny bit of, uh, of red into the, a tiny bit, right? Uh, a tiny bit of red in it. And again, I'm keeping in mind that the, uh, the light is coming in from the left. There's a, here's a shadow grouping. And again, I'm going back to my, my scraping technique. And I want to create a nice textured edge to the right sides of, these, of, of this form. However you can do it. I was, I, scrape, I was scraping a moment ago. Now I'm using the corner of my, uh, the side of my brush to do that. You know, the other thing that I like to do, um, too, um, not making it look too gimmicky, I have a little water bottle. Sometimes when you lay in the, um, <coughs> sometimes when we lay in these, uh, these cadmium colors, they lay in so nice and evenly, which is not necessarily a, a great thing. Oh, I just hit myself in the face with that. <laughs> I like to hit just a little bit of water to lighten up uh, uh, for a, a reflected plane or a lighter plane within the shadow. Sometimes the, the droplets hit the edges of that, it creates additional texture. Um, I can't leave it all hard edged. I want to turn the form of that tree a little bit. So I'm going to grab um, a round, one of my round brushes. And before that wash has a chance to dry, I'm going to hit a couple soft edges to that shadow grouping. And um, you know, I teach a children's class, and whenever I do that for the children, they always go, ooh. So you feel free to go, ooh. The, 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 the form turns, and we want a couple soft edges in there, and that gives our tree a, a, an additional value. And, um, uh, you know, it, it makes it um, uh, look, look slightly rounded. Please do not paint, and I should talk, because I've done this more than once. Don't paint the same shadow shape over and over again. They are similar, but make some large, some medium sized, some small ones. All right, and then again, get ready to go. A couple soft edges along that, that side in there to turn the form. And you can you know, also spritz it for additional texture in there. I'll make a, a you know rather large uh, larger shadow grouping in here, and again all this color is just uh, has more uh, uh, ultramarine blue than uh, than yellow in it. I think I've been there. <laughs> Eagle Lake. You have? Yeah. I think I've been there. Is that is that in the uh, national park? Yes, it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's noted. It's really noted for its, um, you know, it's really noted for its, its, its trails and stuff. But you know, you know, the 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 addition of the shadow right now, you notice something. It makes our lights look like sunlight. You know, it's not until you start getting working those shadows in the picture, which is another reason why I think, um, you know, in oils, when you work in oils, how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay, in um, uh, in oils, uh, you we start with our shadows and work to our lights. In watercolor, because we work on a piece of white paper, we start with our lights and work to our shadows. For a long time, it's kind of difficult to see where our painting is headed with the light effect. For a long time, and please start. You know, I masked it in for the most part with a lot. Oh, there's a, you know there is a few shadows, right? Or at least I try to get a few shadows in it, but you don't really know where the painting's going until you get those shadows, in, you know, in, in, in the in the picture. You know, I I'm looking at this and I can probably darken that up. I'll put a second coat of paint on it. You 
you know, I, when I put that mountain in the back here, a lot of that sh edge got lost because of the, it was still wet. So I can go back into it now and uh, restate it while well, it's dry. You know, and there's more than, um, you know, uh, when you look at this, there's just more than this one dark value in here. There's even a darker value still and a lighter value within the shadow. Well, the lighter value is easy to get. You know, just hit it with a little bit of water. Sometimes I even like to just grab, um, you know, a drop of water, clean water in there, just to thin the shadow out a little bit and lighten it up a little bit. And just let you know, let let the paint let the paint do whatever it wants to do, and not get um, you know, too too involved in that. As I paint the shadow on this, I'm also creating some of the edges, some of the light stuff that's that's going on in here. And I also want to get within this shadow grouping more darks. And for that, we mix up an accent color, a value that's. Um, you know, super, super dark. I'm going to take a CAD, CAD Red Deep and a little ultramarine blue. And you mix a color that looks like black, but it's not black. It's a really dark purple. I could either wait till this is dry, or I can do it now while it's still a little wet. And maybe I could put a, a darker tree trunk in there. This is the accent. This is the darkest valley within the, um, within the shadow. You know, when it dries, it'll look, um, uh, you know, but when you get those, I always think when you get those accents in there, you're really, you know, you're, you're really getting uh, a whole bunch of uh, a nice values throughout. There's some reed grass in the front that's popping in and out of the landscape. You know, I don't want to just randomly organize that. I want there to be, um, I want to, you know, you could use this in a way, these clusters of grass. In the foreground, I, I always want to, and I tried to do that earlier with some of the, those lines in, 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 in the undulation of the water, right? Put them on an angle, the viewer's eyes kind of fall to here, and then perhaps maybe another line or, or, or a lighter valley or something leads you that way, and then you pick up these other lines that lead you back that way, and that, see, there, I just created a Z, or I tried to create a Z in the foreground that the viewer can follow this way, then that way, and then that way, always back, and that's a Z pattern in the front. Now, you can also do that with, I can, I, you know, I'm going to try to do that with some of, some of the grass in the foreground. I'm going to start here in the corner. And then maybe the next, you know, maybe the next cluster that I do is along that diagonal, right? Little spot in here, I could do a, a, you know, a third grouping in here. You know, and these should have, it, where the water's calm, these should have a reflection as well. But you can see how already, the way I've placed them, I just didn't put them across on a straight horizontal. I angled them a little bit. But you gotta do this in a way <laughs> that the viewer is unaware that you're doing that. You gotta organize them in a way just so you don't look obvious about it, right? And then maybe we can send, we can thrust the viewer's eyes. You know, you wanna thrust the viewer's eyes at least three times through the composition. You wanna thrust them once this way, once back, and then one more time that way, at least. And you can also do that with your shapes in the sky, thrust them down that way, back that way, and then back that way. Always on a S or a Z and, and back. So hopefully you got these three clusters of uh, reed grass right now. Kind of follow them, and then I could send the viewer back with a 
with another little cluster. Getting smaller, but you can see with how that what that does for the composition. Right? Again, you got to make you got to do it in a way that it doesn't um, that you're not being very obvious about it. Any questions? I'm using, you know, for this, uh, you know, this, this, uh, uh, this is a number um, six, a script liner brush. I would have thought that I work real small, and I um, would have thought on a large piece of paper, <coughs> larger brushes. That's my excuse for not working. <coughs> Well, actually, I, I, you know, I had a big one and a half for my first wash was a big, pretty big, yeah. pretty big brush, and um, I'm using this is a half inch, you know, for okay. um, you know, way, way into the painting, um, right where the water meets the land. I also want to get it dark. Again, um, I'm using a shadow value green, green that has more blue than yellow in it. I'm, I'm scraping the brush on the side so it's a, not a line but a, a, a decent shape. Could put a couple half tones or soft edges on those um, top parts. Leave the bottom edge hard, but I don't want to soften everything uh, too much either. You don't want everything softened, nor do you want to leave everything hard. Um, you know, you kind of, you kind of want to um, uh, do, do a nice com combination of each. Uh, I, do you want me to go a little longer? Are we good on time? Are we good on time? <laughs> Where? Here? Yeah. yeah. I'll do a few more there. Sure. <laughs> it's the worst when you... You end too early, right? I was wondering if there was an atmospheric thing. No, but you know, you're gonna you're gonna put a couple like I did in the front here. You're gonna want to get a couple darks uh, where these trees meet the, the bottoms. Again, um, uh, you know, uh, I the hard thing I find about doing texture is not um, being uh, everything doing everything the same, same weight, same shape, um, and it's it's a real struggle. Uh, and as a teacher, I've noticed it too. It's a real struggle for people to, you know, to, to get uh, a complexity of shape or, or, or a lot of different shapes in stuff. I don't know what we like harmony, or I don't know what what has to do with why we, why we do that. But um, uh, or you're happy with one shape and you want to repeat it a dozen times. Don't do that. And then again, um, some soft edges on the tops of these forms, but don't again don't soften everything. There's some smaller group groupings, you know. And when you when you put these shapes, and not only you're painting the shape on a tree, but you're painting the light side of another next to it. So you got to think that way too. And more clean water. See, that's not good. So I'll put a, a little smaller cluster in here. What I do to help me figure out what I have to include and not include, so I do a lot of squinting, especially on the spot. I really shut down my eyes. You know, when I shut my eyes down tight, I see the major shapes. You know, when your eyes are wide open, you see way too much information, and you try to paint that. But for a long period of time in our pictures, it's probably a good idea to, to squint a lot. Try to see what, see the light shapes and see the shadow shapes, you know, really, really simply. You know, it's not to the end of the picture where you want to put more detail in and more um, stuff in. Then you open your eyes wide. Oh, that's it. Thank you.
Thanks. Another class. Yeah. A lot of information. Thank you, Marjorie.